Hi, I'm Shazad Mian. I'm editor for Cornea for the One Network, and we're at the American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting here in Chicago, and we have Dr. Farhad Hafizi uh, here with us, who's going to be speaking to us about collagen cross-linking in children with Down syndrome. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing time with us to talk to us a little bit about this. That's Can you tell us a little bit about how children with keratoconus present in your practice? Um, Children with keratoconus represent a special subgroup of um, cross-linking that we have been performing clinically since 12 years now in, in Zurich and Geneva. In, in the very beginning, we decided to only move forward with a cross-linking procedure whenever we see clear progression in, uh, in keratoconus. On one hand, to protect a new emerging technique that should only be used when, when there is a great necessity for it, on the other hand, to gather more clinical data on the safety profile. Now, 12 years later, we have a lot of clinical data. We have hundreds of publications out there. And it was about time to assess whether the special subgroup of children, where keratoconus often is the most aggressive, would also necessitate to, to prove to document progression before treatment, because it would be a pity to lose KMAX readings and increased steepening in a child just to document the progression of keratoconus. So um, we performed a retrospective analysis of all the children we have cross-linked and adolescents we have cross-linked in the past eight years, came up with a number of roughly 70 eyes, and checked on one hand how many of these children were indeed, showed indeed progression after the first initial visit, how many went to cross-linking, and how were the cross-linking results. We saw two exciting and uh, uh, exciting things when, compare, when comparing the results to the adult population. On one hand, the children seem to do just fine after cross-linking. They stabilize, but the effect is contradictory in the three studies published so far. There are two Italian studies that have shown stable results over two and three years, whereas in our study we have stable results over two years and then a loss of significance after three years. So it seems as if cross-linking works well in children, but the long-term beneficial effect remains to be seen, which makes sense because cross-linking is really aggressive, is most aggressive in the young population. And on the other hand, we checked how many of these children indeed progress, and we treat them, and the rate is 88%. So nine children out of 10 will progress once they enter your practice. And then we decided to adopt a different attitude, not to wait anymore for documented progression in children and adolescents, but treat them right away as soon as you have an unambiguous diagnosis. Can you tell us about what age group we're talking about when you're uh, talking about children? Well, we adhere to the WHO definitions of children and adolescents, which is children between the age of 8 and 15 and adolescents between the age of 10 and 19. So when they present to your practice, are there still some clinical signs or criteria that you use to initiate treatment? Well, we, we, need, we need to have uh, keratoconus documented, shine fluke imaging, placebo-based topography. We need to have a, a history of, uh, of uh, clear and distinct loss in best spectral corrected visual acuity, increase in astigmatism, uh, and so on. But, we do not wait for or to document the progression anymore. Okay, great. So can you tell us a little bit more about your experience with the treatment itself, how the children go through it? Um, very interesting, very diverse, just like in the adult population. I had nine-year-olds that didn't really need anything specific and others that needed sedation. One or two needed even general anesthesia, but this is, uh, this is by far the exception. And hopefully with the upcoming of transepithelial cross-linking, which should not be performed yet because we don't have good clinical and solid data out there. But I think in two, one or two years we will have them. Transepithelial cross-linking will, will make things so much easier. So, so far your experience has been with epithelium off for the treatment? Absolutely. And the reason is there is no scientific, clinical scientific backing and no published long-term results on the beneficial effects of transepithelial. All the solutions out there show a certain concentration of riboflavin in the stroma and certainly a certain cross-linking effect, but there is no long-term long-term uh, data available. And the, 
and and on top of this, some of the commercially available solutions with transit, for transepithelial crosslinking, if you take them back to the rabbit eye, they simply would not work. No increase in biomechanical stiffening in the lab. So it's all about modifying the solutions to get good penetration through the intact epithelium. And uh, we will be there soon, but we are not there yet. What kind of complications have you seen in your experience in this age group? In this particular age group, um, it's, it's all about compliance. So uh, working a lot with the parents, we uh, luckily had no major complications in this group. What we see, what we can see as major complications is everything related to an open corneal surface. So not really specific to cross-linking, but rather to uh, uh, a large diameter of ratio and proper handling of it. You mentioned your concern that the data is limited up to two years out. Are mm -hmm. there other concerns that you have in terms of long-term treatment in this age group? Not really, no. If it was my kid, I would treat it immediately because gaining two years in a, let's say, 13-year-old with a massive increase in K readings over the past eight months is just beneficial. It's all about gaining time. And as I said, it's not totally clear whether our data will be consistent showing um, a non-significance after three years or, or whether the two other data will be pertinent. Uh, it's, it's just a certain, certain contradiction in, in the three-year results, but we might see more data in the next one to two years that clarify this question. Do you have any experience in repeated treatments in any of your cases? And if not, do you have recommendations? Um, little experience, as does, uh, to my knowledge, nobody has extended experience. We have treated uh, various cases of pellucidal marginal degeneration four, five, six, eight years ago with a centered uh, irradiation, and the centered irradiation is, is apparently not sufficient in a disease that, that touches predominantly the periphery of the cornea. So the early PMD cases showed progression, and we had to recrosslink them. We talk about less than 10 cases, and we, we didn't see any, any negative effect on the cornea. Just to summarize, in children who present in your practice, uh, you, do you have any recommendations for early treatments prior to collagen cross-linking? Well, uh, context lenses are, of course, an issue in the young population because we want to make sure that we avoid amblyopia by all means in the young population. But I see clear, a clear distinction between the visual rehabilitation and the avoidance of amblyopia on one hand and the cross-linking treatment to prevent progression of the disease on the other hand. Great. So let's talk a little about specifically in children with Down syndrome. Is your protocol different in Down syndrome children versus uh, your standard pediatric protocol? Yes, it is. Um, we have called it the Geneva Protocol, and it has two arms. Um, they are based on the compliance of the patients. If we have a good compliance, we can perform a standard epi of procedure and with the help of the parents can then, um, can then uh, move on with a regular post-operative scheme. If the compliance is poor, we might need a sedation, a certain sedation, or even a general anesthesia for treatment. And if the compliance is poor to, to a state where we would expect massive eye rubbing and absolute non-compliance in a 15-year-old strong boy regarding the post-op treatment, we would perform an epi on treatment even though we don't have solid clinical data, but um, the complications we have seen in Down children, the complication, there is one paper in the literature that is a case series of, I think, three eyes, and they had two major complications, not by the UVA treatment, but by the post-op period and regarding the handling of the patient. And the patient was almost, had to stay under constant sedation for four or five days because mm -hmm. of, he wouldn't let anybody touch his eye after the treatment. So in these cases, we advocate a transepithelial cross-linking already now. Better to have a less documented, but certainly not harmful effect than, than a no effect or even a greater risk for infection. Great. Do you have an upper limit to treatment in terms of corneal curvature? Are there children who have steep enough cornea where you would not recommend collagen cross-linking? Um, we have limited data on this, we have safety profiles regarding the general population and all age groups where we know that um, 58 diopters, anything above 58 diopters represents a certain, a certain increase in the failure rate of, the, of, of stabilizing the disease. We would talk about 4 to 5%. We talk about um, having um, a success rate of around 90% versus 95 or 96%. 
other than this, no. And personally, I've treated children with a K-Max reading of up to 78 diopters because they were at the verge of needing uh, penetrating or keratoplasty or deep lamellar keratoplasty at the age of 9 or 10. Mm -hmm. So every year I gain would be beneficial. Have you had to go back and uh, do keratoplasty in any of these children? Hopefully not. No. Not yet. No. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you.